Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. And if, if I may, just to add, and I will be coming back on some of the points that Senator Black has raised, uh, I know that Senator Black would have liked to have gone into another gear again in relation to the points she made, and I'm just underscoring it. So thank you very much indeed for that. Is that fair comment? I thought it was. I thought it was. Thought it was. Senator Nile O'Donnell, please. Maybe fair warning for me then. I think it would okay, be you go for that. No, no, go for it. <laughs> uh, Chair, thanks, and apologies to our visitors just for missing the, missing the earlier part of their presentation. Um, just before I come to my question, a point you raised, uh, Mr Garvey, uh, earlier on in response to, I think, Deputy Connolly, um, in relation to emergency accommodation. As soon as we become aware of an emergency accommodation centre, What's the process involved in the, the Ombudsman's office becoming aware? We, we, we inform us, the department inform us uh, regularly. Uh, they give us a list of centres where they are, how many people are in them and so on. Okay, so how regularly would that be in terms It'll of... It would be at the moment in around monthly. Okay, and from you becoming aware uh, of that as an office to getting out uh, to monitor or observe uh, the emergency accommodation centres, what would kind of generally be the time scheme We've, involved? The, the way we structured our programme this year was we did it largely in spring and in early autumn. Uh, we tend to avoid winter generally just simply because it's, it can be difficult, road access and so on, and we tend to avoid summer because the there tends to be relocation within centres of population over the course of summer because it's good holidays. Yeah. So we have found that we get the higher attendance of residents when we visit in spring and autumn, so that's what we've been doing. Uh, so we've just completed our programme this autumn. Uh, there's, one, there's a small number of centres we intend to follow up on or that we haven't reached yet that we'll be reaching, but we've, we've had more or less done now. So once we become aware of where centres are, then we, should, we can schedule a visit that generally for logistical reasons, as I said earlier, we will try and maximise the number of centres we cover in the one trip, so the ones that are geographically close to each other. Okay, but if you become aware of a centre, say, in the winter, are mm -hmm. you not going to visit it until the spring? It would, it would depend. Um, that hasn't happened yet, okay. because we, the, the emergence and the use of emergency centres is new. So, as Paul said, we evolve our process as we go. So that is another evolution we will need to look at as to whether well, we need to visit centres quicker once we become aware of Yeah, well, I would, I would commend that to you because it probably says all that needs to be said when you state that part of the reason you don't go to some of these places is because of road access. Um, and, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're able to say with the you know, benefit that we have will, will not go because it's tricky in the winter, but, but these people are living here and one of the big problems we encountered when we met uh, with people living in these places was the issue of, of travel uh, and being able to access uh, transportation in and out uh, of, of these places. So I would commend you to look at that uh, and have a think about that because certainly from what we understand as a committee and from everything you've said um, uh, this morning that I have heard, there's no shortening in these centres. They're not reducing, it's actually the opposite, so the likelihood is that there is going to be another centre pop-up this winter, um, maybe more. Um, so uh, I, I would suggest that, uh, with the greatest respect, and I'd say this, that, that you make it a priority as soon as you can to get out to see, and see those. Uh, I, I'm keen just to ask a, a brief question, uh, Cahirlach, just uh, around the issue of your, your statutory remit uh, in terms of the, the visits uh, and the observations that you make. I know, and I've heard you this morning, I've seen some of the media carrying uh, your statement uh, about wanting greater powers around the administrative process, and that's that's fair enough. I think that's a very legitimate call. Uh, I'm keen to know how you have found uh, the, the process of the recommendations or the observations that you do make to the department or the relevant uh, agency um, in terms of actions. Um, so, is there a role in, for example, internally a monitor uh, of of what actions the department has taken in terms of recommendations or observations that you have made, and are you frustrated or, uh, I suppose, prohibited by a lack of, of uh, I suppose, proactive functions um, to compel uh, the department to do uh, some things? We, we meet with the department very regularly, and the issues that arise in our visits are taken up with the department and we monitor progress against those in subsequent meetings. So the, the issues that, um, that we deal with are dealt, that we raise with them are dealt with. Um, the main issues that the committee has been touching on about the length of time people stay in and so on doesn't fall 
read the, those conversations about the practicalities, access to facilities, access to transport, mm -hmm. uh, movement between centres, access to, as we've heard, to medical cards and so on. Those are the kind of issues we tend to be dealing with, and they do get addressed by the department. The, the issues around the length of stay and delay and so on are not part of that conversation. With the greatest respect, Mr. Kendall, that's a very universal statement. You know, because we have heard that we have met people who don't have medical cards and have been waiting for a prolonged period of time. And there, there are other examples uh, in terms of uh, what you've just said. So I, I'm not so sure that the evidence that we have heard either in other presentations or in terms of our own visits point to a situation where it's sorted. I mean, that, that sounds quite universal uh, to me because you said we have raised things with the department that aren't sorted. Um, so, I, I mean, I just, I just don't know that the universality of that is, is, is accurate. Um, so uh, my question is coming from a very sincere place in terms of trying to further enable your work and, and, and your remit in terms of uh, what you're doing. I think the frustration here probably across the board does rest with other agencies and with the department in terms of where people are finding themselves uh, in these situations. What I would like to see uh, and hear from you is if there are instances where you are consistently identifying a problem and whether it's residents themselves, whether it's politicians, whether it's NGOs or agencies are identifying problems, if they aren't being um, uh, properly addressed or rectified or sorted by the department, how do we then collaboratively, if that needs to be the case, ensure the department and government rectify it? Because all of the well, not all of the evidence. Fair enough, there has been some significant progress made in some fields. To be fair, but there is quite a substantial amount of evidence, particularly in emergency accommodation, that points to these issues not being resolved, and it also points to there not being a will in many uh, instances to resolve them either. Okay. Just to, to pick up the issue, let's take a specific example mm. about emergency accommodation and medical cards. Mm. Um, we have, when, when issues are brought to our attention, we raise them with the department and with the HSE and we make sure they're addressed. So okay. they're addressed in respect of the issues that are brought to us. Um, as new emergency accommodation centres come online, then the issues may well arise again. I think um, quite a lot, yourself, um, Senator, quite a lot of um, your colleagues and colleagues in the Doyle do bring complaints via my office, and mm. we're able to raise those also. But it also would help us to have a, a broader picture if you if you engage with us in in that way also. Um, my particular point, not it wasn't to make the point that everything is. Um, absolutely splendid, just to say that as and when we raise complaints, they're addressed. But whether always the mm. sometimes it will be individual ones, and it may not be that the systemic issues are being properly dealt with. And I would happily continue yeah. to work on those until we get them addressed. The, the issue we find things pop up as issues as the system is extended. And so a lot of the issues we're dealing with at the moment, the, the issues in respect to the older centres, the more established centres, and we get fewer complaints, fewer issues raised. It's the emergency accommodation at the moment that's generating the principal additional work for us. And some of the newer centres, which um, where problems that have been addressed in older ones continue to crop up. Okay, um, Chair, just two questions, uh, follow up to that. Um, in terms of them being addressed, I suppose there's a difference then, uh, Mr. Tyndall, between them being addressed and them being addressed satisfactorily, and that's that's the point I want to try and kneel down on. So, I mean, if you're telling me they're, they're addressed, uh, are they addressed uh, satisfactorily? And second of all, um, in terms of the issues being raised with you, I'm keen just to get an understanding of how, because uh, I understand a wee bit about now the process of the visits. Um, is there a way for the residents to contact you outside of the visits? Is there a regular kind of hotline or whatever contact it might be? 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, yes, there is. Um, we have online contact details. We bring those details to business and we have them displayed at centres when we go. We do get a relatively small number of complaints from residents via that source rather than via the visits. Mm. But one of the reasons we have continued and expanded the visits programme is we find that's where we get most of the issues raised with us by residents. Yes, they can contact us through other mechanisms, and they do, and we bring those to the residents' attention. But in practice, most of our complaints arise from direct contact with the residents on their visits. Could I just make a point, yeah. sorry, about, the, about our work? Um, we deal with individual complaints, uh, and uh, we get a certain number of those from our visits, a certain number made to the office. There's a parallel process going on in relation to the thematic issues that we've identified, and as, as Peter said, the big bulk of the work for us at the moment is in the emergency area. Mm. So the example that's been given a couple of times about the medical cards, in addition to dealing with individual complaints from people in emergency centres, we are engaging with the HSC at a national level to resolve the fundamental problem of GP access in communities and uh, numbers arriving in a community at very short notice without the uh, prior planning or, or services. That's also happened, I know it was mentioned earlier on about the PPSNs. Without your PPSN, everything else, you, you can't access medical cards, can't access basic payments, all the so-called material reception conditions that we're obliged to provide. Uh, our office has engaged nationally with the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection uh, to resolve the issue of availability of uh, PPSNs because prior to the increase in numbers, they were processed in Balseskin, as Peter mentioned earlier on. A lot of the local offices weren't familiar with the process and there's a, a sort of lower threshold for eligibility for asylum seekers, I understand. Uh, as a result of our engagement with the uh, department on that matter, uh, a briefing uh, document, I understand, was issued to the local offices. So they were aware that if somebody presents, and that has helped I suppose in terms of a practical example of that, uh, we've been to one area twice within the space of three months. And uh, very busy at first visit, medical cards uh, and PPSNs were the big issues. Mm. We went back to that area three months later and those issues have mainly been resolved. Now we know that's only one issue but as Sean and we've mentioned a couple of times, our process is evolving as we move on and as we identify thematic issues in whether it's well, dealing with the individual complaints we do address them at a national level as well. Okay. Um, I suppose from our perspective, we're trying to generate a bit more light here uh, than, than heat, so that's why uh, we're kind of very uh, keen to tease out some of the minutiae, maybe, of, of this stuff. Um, tell me if it doesn't fall within your remit, but I'm just keen to get your view on this issue of people with an emergency accommodation being relocated um, at short notice. Um, we have heard of some instances where people staying in hotels have been put on the buses and sent halfway uh, across the country in order to facilitate an outstanding booking uh, in the hotel that's being used as emergency accommodation. I wonder if that's something that has been uh, raised with you. What are your observations and thoughts uh, on that? But with the caveat that I appreciate if that doesn't fall within your remit. No, it does um, squarely within remit, and yes, it has been raised. Um, I think in my opening remarks, I was fairly clear that um, after progress had been made in direct provision centres, yeah. the use of emergency accommodation puts us squarely back into the set of problems we had at the outset with direct provision. And emergency accommodation is, for all of the reasons that committee members have explored, entirely unsuitable. And of course, because it's being taken on at short notice, um, there are issues about the length of stay that's possible. So people are finding themselves in exactly the circumstance in which you describe. Mm. Um, and I think um, Deputy Connolly's um, particular issue around the um, the need to move people on who have got permission to stay. That's the fundamental point at the moment. The numbers don't quite balance, but, but um, mm. if people who had permission to remain were able to move out of direct provision, then the use of emergency accommodation could certainly be reduced to a huge extent, if not eliminated entirely. But while it, the, the, that is a problem of Sure. For the individual, it's a problem for them or for the groups of people mm. who are moved. But, but in reality, that is a problem of the availability of, 
accommodation for the reasons I've described. But you see, Mr. Kendall, it brings me back to my earlier point around now how we action a response to that, because when the departmental officials were in front of us, I think it was the deputy sack gen <coughs> in front of us uh, a few months ago, it was simply a case of, well, we can't apply direct, direct provision standards to emergency accommodation, and to blown our in. Chennai, basically. Um, so th 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 that is why I, I think, certainly in terms of the, the legitimate call that you've made this morning uh, around greater powers in terms of the administrative issue, I need to get a clearer understanding as a member of this committee as we go forward in compiling this report that surely to go out there has to rest a responsibility somewhere where these things can then actually be actioned. Because if the department are coming in in front of us and saying, well, look, we can't apply our emergency or direct provision uh, standards don't apply to emergency accommodation. And when I asked them, could the issue of people being moved again happen again, they said it could. So, I mean, like, none of us should be content with that. There has no, to no. be, there has to be, but, but that's okay, not being content with it. There has to then be someone ultimately responsible for this. And it may well be the department, but my concern and my frustration is that listening to the department, they seem content enough. I mean, as, as I've said, the only medium-term solution to this is to have an active resettlement program for people, initially those people who have permission to remain, and ultimately, potentially, for people who have the right to work and who might be able to meet the costs of their own accommodation as a consequence. There's no, um, as long as emergency accommodation is used, the problems that you're describing, which are real problems, will continue. And essentially, we've gone back to the situation we had before direct provision was improved. So these things like um, Things like the uh, play facilities, which have been talked about, things like the ability to cook, um, all of those issues have been lost by the use of emergency accommodation. And the only way to get around it is to resettle those people currently in direct provision in the short term to make room for some of those people who are having to use emergency accommodation. I can't see any other practical solution. Well, Chair, I've finished, but the, the other option is to build more housing. Uh, sorry, I, I, again, in my introductory <laughs> remarks. But I understand. I, no, 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 fair enough. No, I, no. I, I, I'm not saying that in an adversarial way. I'm just saying it, no, that no, it's another, because of course it's another my, option. My office also gets complaints about housing course. waiting lists, about homelessness, and so on. The, the issue of the shortage of affordable rented housing is, a, a, is one that um, will have to be tackled to deal with all of these problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator.